I feel like you get bigger artists than I do. Like, if you take a step I think back. It's always like the grass is green on the other side. Thank you for watching Shirley's Temple. Please subscribe and turn on your notifications to find out when I'm dropping my next interview. Welcome to Shirley's Temple. We got Mr. Vlad TV on today. Clap it up, clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. There's a long journey that, that got me here. <laughs> Definitely. Yep. Both physically and emotionally. Exactly. But thank you for being here. For those who don't know, um, Vlad actually reached out to me when g Easy came on Shirley's Temple. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all from the Bay. It meant a lot to me, you know. Um, proceeded to start working with you, booking talent, doing interviews. Fast forward, last year on Thanksgiving, we had a public falling out. Yeah. Really deeply affected me, particularly mental health wise. Uh, I mean, I, I felt bad about that whole situation and, and your role in it. Um, and you, you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. It just got, unfortunately, you got swept up into a bigger uh, situation, and I felt bad about including you in it. And um, I'd been wanting to just, you know, think about when the right time was to kind of publicly apologize. And, and that, that's why what I first did is I publicly apologized. You know, and just left it at that and see if there was any going to be any sort of follow up conversations on that on, on your terms. Yeah. You know, because I felt I was I was the person that was wrong in this regard. You were you were doing, you know, you were minding your own business and got and got kind of caught up in other bullshit. Um, so, you know, and then when you ask, hey, can you can you come on the show? And I'm like, yeah, you definitely deserve that, you know, to kind of come on me, come on your platform. And in terms of the explanation, I, I said, whatever you want to do. I appreciate that, first of all. But I guess I wanted to know, like, what prompted it a year later? Because it was a whole year. Yeah. So, so, so let's, just, let's just set the stage. Okay. To, so everyone explains, so everyone understands kind of what happened. So you and I were working together and you book interviews for me, right? As well as do some interviews. But I think at that point, you were primarily booking interviews for me. We, we, we had gotten a pass on the Sweetie interview. And... Off the cuff, I just made a random tweet of like, oh, you know, Sweetie only sold like 8,000 copies. Had she done a Vlad TV interview? She I was actually going to ask. She, she would have she doubled that. I was going to ask what your intent with that tweet was. It, it was just me talking my shit. I mean, if you look at my history, I don't really hold my tongue. You know, I, I am where I am because I, I go hard in, in my interviews and my opinions and everything else. Like that. I just threw it out there. I didn't think anyone would give a shit. I had at the time maybe 150,000 followers. I don't have a big Twitter account. That tweet started to go viral, which was really unexpected. Is there a part of you that is happy when that happens? I mean, you stay in the, in the public eye for what you do, but in a way there's sort of, sort of a, a frustration Overall, like I, I've spent 16 years of my life, like a third of my life I've devoted to just Vlad TV and probably about 40 something percent I've devoted to hip hop. Thousands of interviews, everything I, I, I finance myself, you know, just over a decade of grinding independently to get these big moments, to, to continuously get millions of views and to be the top media outlet and then to constantly be shut down by almost every label. Like there's always the publicist at the label that doesn't like Vlad TV and continues to send, you know, people like Benny the Butcher to go do double XL that gets 5,000 views and ignores the Vlad TV that would get two, three million views. It was a frustrating kind of thing. So that tweet started to go viral to get millions of impressions to the point where Sweetie responded. And she said, actually, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Here's, Here's a, a video, screenshot. a Snoop video I'm just watching. I had no idea that you even requested an interview. But I, like, I, I fuck with you. And at that point... Which at that point, I think you should have been happy. But instead, you got mad. Yeah. That's what it fucked me up. Because I was like, she made you look good as fuck. Like, what? Yeah. What are we talking about I, I, sh right I, sh now? I should have stopped. Um... I, I should have stopped. And, and, you know, I'm not going to talk about excuses or whatever about personally going through my life because my life, it doesn't matter. I'm an adult. I should have stopped. And I fucked up. And I ended up posting our, our text messages right. about that to try to respond to her about that publicly because right. now Shade Room is picking it up and yes. it's, it's going everywhere. And you're right. I should have just stopped. And in the process, I ended up dragging in, I said, reposting one of your text messages. Right. Which you completely which I totally, could have I left. totally should have, shouldn't have done. And I was wrong for that. 
You even like I would have been mad regardless, but you could have left my name out, Brian. Yeah, you're right. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I I I blacked out and uh, I threw you under the bus, and this is why uh, I felt I felt bad about the situation. And then it started sort of kind of like a, a bit of a back and forth with yeah. social media. This is something that really impacted me. One, because as a journalist, you don't make a lot of money. As a freelance journalist, there's no stability financially. So being able to work for you, I made the most money I've made in my career. So in that, I felt really grateful and I I'm a hustler by nature. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you were paying me a lot or little, I was going to go hard. But the fact that I had this opportunity to make a little more doing what I love at the same time, I was very grateful. Yeah. And, that's, and that's where I thought I could turn to you as a friend beyond all of this. So that really is where my emotion and my mental health, you know, was severely just like hurt. The, the, the reason that you ask why I spent a long time not responding, the reason was um, when you and I were, were texting, I was like, all right, fuck it then. I'm going, you know, because you're protecting your sources. I'm mad about the situation. I felt like, you know, I've been holding you down, like, you know, paying you more than you got paid. And honestly, you could look at the, 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 the interviews. We ultimately, you know, took a loss from the interviews, I unfortunately. I Which is not your fault. I have a point. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's I not your fault. Thank you. It's not your fault. Yeah. Our audience did not react the way I was hoping. And I, yeah. but I spent a lot of time and money investing yeah. into trying to get our audience cool with you and your brand. Because you were getting in very good interviews. Like the interviews yeah. you were booking were very impactful and, and important people. And some of them did actually do well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And some of them did kind of get a little bit over, over the top. Said me and Fredro were the new blood and boost. Yeah, you and Fredro, you know, but... Ultimately, you know, it, it is what it is. And as a business owner, I, I take that loss. I don't complain about it. I don't cry about it. You know what I'm saying? But what had happened was during the back and forth, and when you and I were texting, I was like, all right, fuck it. If you want to protect your sources and I'm, I'm frustrated by the situation, I choose violence. I'm going to turn up. I choose violence as a Game of Thrones meme. I don't watch Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. I remember hearing, I I hear about hearing an interview where you actually addressed that. It's Game of Thrones. If you like SZA's new album, she says, I choose violence. It's not a... Some obscure term. It's no, a it's a, I, it's a I, very known term. I know you weren't at, serious. At I'm no just... point did I want did I try to threaten or I physically know. hurt a woman on any level. But I felt like you had painted you were starting to paint it that way. So I felt like let me just back away before I get a Me Too moment of threatening women, which I'm not doing. Like yeah. it's just a meme. It's a meme I wasn't term. I was saying yeah. you literally choose violence. It was more yeah. so just your response. Yeah, it was a fucked up response. But I, I, that's the reason why I kept a long time of not responding because I'm like. I don't want to get me too'd. Like, you know what I'm saying? And this is a real thing right now. It, okay. it's, it's, it's a real thing and it's happening in, in, you know, in my business with, with people that are around me. So I'm like, let me just ease back. And then once everything calms down or whatever else, I'm going to publicly go forward and we'll see what Shirley, how Shirley reacts to it. It's totally up to her. Cause right. it, it, she may have been like, no, fuck your apology. Like yeah. it is what it is. And I, I was prepared to accept that because ultimately like, I'm not making excuses here. Yeah. It's me. You know, it's me and the overall frustration of being me, of, you know, being in this business and constantly being overlooked for the big artist interviews over and over again. Bro, look at the level of talent you're getting. Like, I, I feel like you get bigger, bigger artists than I do. Like, if you take a step I think back. It's always like the grass is greener on the other side. Because to me, I always want to branch out of music. Mm -hmm. And I think it's dope that you get, like, Mike Tyson, like, you know, you flew to interview Vanilla Ice. Where was he at? Miami. Miami. Like shit yeah. like that. Like that's dope. And you actually have a YouTube audience. So if anything, I was trying to take a page out of your book. Like, yeah, I, I feel you. Like, you know, and, and the thing is we, we still wanted to work with you because you were still, you're now going on the booking side yeah. of things. I had to look at that situation and be like, I fucked up. I fucked up on multiple levels and I'm just gonna have to hold this and see if I can fix it at a later point. You know, A I whole mean? year later. Yeah. Whenever possible, I try not to keep a beef going. Like I just did drink champs. Me and Nori didn't speak for three years. Yeah. We had a whole falling out over the phone. Yeah. Again, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a perfect person. I'm not saying I'm great at interpersonal relationships. You know, I have my, my bullshit, you know, uh, like everyone else in this industry. And me and him had a falling out, but slowly we kind of got 
back cool again. And, you know, I just did Drink Champs when I was in Miami. Yeah. Me and WAC 100 didn't talk for 10 years. Yeah, I saw and that. And we, we got well, on the I phone. I watch all these interviews. I know everything. I, I got, You know, I mean, like, like <laughs> sometimes shit can be squashed. And a lot sure. of times it has to do with the person you're dealing with has to have a certain level of growth. For you sure. know, if it's, if, if it's the exact same person on the exact same bullshit, that's true. You probably are going to get the exact same response. That's but, so true. But, but if you look, a certain amount of time has passed. You see the person's acting differently, behaving differently. Like, yeah. you know, that their business has grown. They're not, you know, they're not struggling and, and sort of on the edge all the time. You could, you could have a, you usually could have some sort of intelligent back and forth with that person. For sure. How lit did they get you on Drink Champs? Because I'm going to get you litter. Okay. So this is uh, the UCA. Here, I'm gonna hand this okay. to you. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, so wait. So, so this is not like a regular uka. This like no, so, this, this is, is like the I, first ever cannabis an iPad uka. Like literally, it's the first ever cannabis uka. Here, if you want to use the tip. It's like and metal it's, and ru hard rubber. Like, right. Yeah. Okay. Literally. All right. So, boom. That goes like that. Yes. Okay. Do you have? Yeah. Go for it. A. Oh, so you don't need the. The coals and whatever else. Exactly. Right? So it's it's like a pod system. So it's kind of similar to the Nespresso machine. You just pop it in and it's ready to go. These are the pods. This is the interior okay. pod. How much one of these run? $3.99. 400 bucks. Yeah. All right. Don't worry because we got you your own. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. You this see? Nice. It's lit on Shirley's <laughs> Temple. I'm digging it. I'm right? digging it. Okay. We'll put you want to hand it to me? Because I'm going to okay, hit it. No, you're Sorry. good. But really, how fucked up did you get on these channels? I mean, I, I stayed relatively more or less sober. I mean, the argument with, with Nori was over me not drinking and him saying, you got to drink. And Why I'm, weren't you drinking? I, I was just a little nervous about drinking on camera. Black, you know that's the whole point. I know. I know. And I, I don't think I, I'd watched enough of the show to know that there's drinking games kind of oh, okay. spread out. Like there's like a, like a A or B drinking game. I saw you drinking on Math Hopper. How much did I drink? Literally, it was the same drink being nursed. Oh, what was in there? Like probably vodka or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, the whole Russian Russian side of me. But yeah, um, but no, I, I did. I did go along and drink. I'm like, yo, this is his show. This is this is his uh, look and feel. So let me let me just go along with it. Nice. And and we got to hang out uh, the, the whole next day, and it was it was dope. That's you dope. Know, it, you it, was just, it was just really dope to kind of because because he really was a friend of mine before. What was the beef? It, it was over that. It, it was like, yo, why don't you drink champs? Yeah, I got you. I'm not going to drink. Why aren't you going to drink? It was because, over. That's yeah. what he, And then because 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 I'm a CEO. And he's like, he's like, yo, I've had, I've had Puffy on here. He's a bigger CEO than you. And it's like, and then, and then turned into. Is it a requirement to, to drink on drink champs? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's whack. That's like me making people smoke when they come. Well, I guess. I, I think it just kind of came down to to me, you know, and then it, it, it turned into a. Do you know who I am both ways? And, you know, Wait, it's like. Really? It's over. Some, see, that, something that stupid is laughable, though. It, it, it was basically. It, it was who that. Who took it to and, social media, Vlad? Well, <laughs> Nori had mentioned it. Him and Fat Joe kind of had a conversation about it on Fat Joe's Live. Okay. And he had mentioned a little bit on his show. He kind of touched on it. Um, but not, not to the point where, you know, the, the whole thing is like when I look at situations like this. Like we, we could all disagree, you know, at the point that you start talking about people's families and kids and wanting someone dead and start saying racist shit and whatever else. That's when I say, nah, I'm good. Like yeah. if this is, if this is what happens when you push a person to a relatively simple back and forth, like, you know, no one's been hurt. No one lost a lot of money. Like it's just a simple back and forth. Yeah. If, if, if you go completely out the window with that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to work it out with you. And we're just going to. Has someone violated? I've had all types of bullshit over the years. You know what I'm saying? I've had all types of dumb shit. Yeah. And, and certain people is just like, I keep them at a distance. Yeah. Certain, so, certain people I, I work it out with. Sure. I, that's just life. I have to, I mean, part of my job is just dealing with a lot of people, a lot of personalities. And, yeah. and the constantly, not only the regular personalities, but also the constantly new people that are being like every week, there's new people I'm meeting and yeah. having interviews with essentially. For sure. We're gonna take another breather. This is a gift from Sluggers. Okay. So these are my favorite pre-rolls. If you oh. want to open the pail, their slogan is, Sheesh. if you grow it, they will come. And they're best known for their juiced joint packs, 
which are triple infused joints that comes with premium whole nug flour, solventless hash, diamonds, and it's hand rolled in keep. Okay, now, what are these cards? You gotta open it. It's like little playing cards. Uh, okay, I see. Okay, so these are joints. Uh, okay, yes. all right. I just want you to appreciate. Yeah. I know you like pre-rolls. Yeah, these are nice. These are fire. If you want to spark one up. Sure, why not? So are you cool smoking on camera then? Yeah, I'm cool. Okay. I smoke. I smoke. Smoke weed every day. If you know me, you know I love palm trees. King Palm is one of the best rap companies on the market. The first to pioneer the all natural tobacco free palm leaf roll. If that's not enough, they lit up the smoke shop industry by releasing their flavored palm leaf roll with a squeeze and pop terpene infused capsule inside the filter tip. Now for the major reveal, King Palm is now evolving into an all encompassing rap company with their brand new tobacco line dropping this year. The tobacco flavor cones come in three styles, strawberry, kiwi, banana cream, and natural sweet cones. They also have their perfectly cut flat wrap five pack tobacco sheets to roll your blunt, which comes in blueberry, honey cognac, and natural sweets. Get yours at your local smoke shop or your local 7-Eleven and look out for their collab with the game dropping as well. You know what it is though? I just, I just want to say this. Like the, the thing with me and Nori was uh, there's this producer named Sam Sneed. I was talking to him about doing an interview. And uh, as we were talking, he was like, yeah, I want to do your show and I want to do Drink Champs. He's like, are you and Nori cool? And I'm like, not really. He's like, oh, really? Why not? So I explained the situation to him. And as I'm explaining it, I'm realizing how stupid it sounds. Literally, when the, you said that, I was like- This is the first like, time. This is the first time I'm saying it out loud to somebody. There's no And way. I'm like, and now we're not talking because of this back, dumb back and forth. And I'm like, all right, I, I got to, you know, I'm going to reach out to them and, yeah. you know, see what's up. And, you know, everyone functions at their own, at their own path. But sometimes you got to like, you got to listen to yourself. For sure. You know, yeah. like, like, like say the shit out loud or, or describe it to somebody. Yeah. And you know, if it doesn't if it doesn't stand up, you might be the problem. Facts. So I just want to process this. All right. uh, when the incident took place, yeah, it was on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I had just got out of a movie. I think I saw Wakanda or something. And then, yeah, we get on the phone, and you're just like yelling and threatening. And just like very well, I was angry. I wasn't threatening. I was just saying, yo, I'm gonna put this shit on blast. That's what threatening. I wasn't. Threatening, I, threatening. Man. I was just like, I was like angry at the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, well, you, because you were just protecting your sources and I was annoyed about that because I was like, I know who's behind this. And then, and then I find out from Baller Alert who actually is the person Yeah, because she's it. butthurt too that she didn't get a Saweetie interview. <laughs> right. Well, look at that. Look but at that. But walk me through that day for you. Like, did, did something else trigger this? Because. All right. If you, if you want to know the reason, like, like I, don't, I, don't, I didn't want to say this because it sounds like an excuse. It's, it's not an excuse. We all go through all life, right. God. We're all human. I've all had right. really bad days. Okay. So if you watch Vlad TV interviews before that date, you will notice that I sound a little bit more nasally and congested. What had happened was a few days before that incident, I had this uh, procedure where they put balloons in your nose and they move I had a deviated septum. Oh, a lot of people talk about that. I think it's called balloon rhinoplasty or something. It's not like a, it's not an, it is an operation. It's not an operation, but they basically, they give you, they drug you up and they put these kind of balloons in your nose and the balloons move everything aside. So okay. now I can breathe through my nose. Yeah. Up until that point, I couldn't breathe through my nose. Like just in life? Just in life. Yeah. Okay. So I had that operation and because of the post-op, they gave me all these steroids. Of the operation. Oh my so God. So I was steroided up during that whole time. That makes so much sense. And, and, and I didn't want to say this in a tweet or during the initial conversation because I'm like, I'm just making excuses and I'm an nah, adult. I'm I an adult. That. I'm an adult. Yeah. And I don't want you to think that it wasn't me, it was drugs. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like prescribed drugs, that. but whatever. But I'm like, I'm trying to take response because ultimately it's still me, like, regardless right. of what I'm on. I am who I am, but right. but that's what was going on. If you really like, if you really want to know, yeah, it was I, I was not pleasant around anybody. Okay, during that week. Thank you. So, like, honestly, like, and, and that makes so much sense. Yeah, though. I, I, I was like, just I was on some bullshit. Like you know, because of because I'm, I'm I don't take drugs, I don't take pills, yeah. I don't do coke. Like, so being on steroids was like Damn. weird for me. You know what I'm saying? And it, I, I I couldn't figure out my emotions during yeah. that time. But that that's what I was going through. Just to be totally honest. Yeah. 
I think what hurt me more too was you knew how much I was trying to protect the publicist. So then when you said her name, I was just yeah. like. Shout out to Baller Alert. They're the ones who told me. Like in a DM? Like. They, they called me. Oh my. We got, we got on the phone. They didn't deny it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like. So then you're just egged on more. I'm, I'm, I'm being egged on. Yeah. I'm being egged it's on. Like, Vlad, I understand your resentment towards labels trying to block you. Like, trust me. I understand that. Yeah. But you can't target the person. I can't target the person who's blocking my business? I mean… Really? How, how, how's that? Like, I, I feel like… And she's female, so it was like a… She's a like, person. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, like, okay. like, she, like, like, we're dealing with people. Like, you know, you're a person. I'm a person. The, the, the gender part is just… Is not important to the conversation at hand. We're all people. Like, you know, we're all trying to provide. We're all trying to make money. We're all trying to do a great job. You know, I'm not out blocking anybody else's shit. I would never do that. Like, in fact, if you look my history. What if you saw it as, what if you, what if it's, she's protecting her artist? You could work with me and still protect your artist. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like to all the labels out there. That like, just sounds like well, a conversation well, you guys well, need well, to well, have. Well, you know, here's the thing. Like, like I'm, I'm, I've always been a reasonable person. I've even, like, you know, we can even work out situations where you can see the interview before it drops for certain types of artists. It's not something I do every day, but it has happened before. You know what I wow, mean? Wow, that sounds, that's like most people would say no. Yeah. Most people would say no. But depending on the artist, like, all right, like, I'll let you, like, I'll let you review it because I've gotten passes when I've done interviews. Who's and someone asked, who's asked to watch the interview? I think the Smokey Robinson interview. They I mean, asked I to review see that. It. That's Smokey Robinson. Yeah, Who else? I, that's what I'm saying. Once you get to these real high levels, sure. you, you ask, you you ask for you that want. type of thing. And I'll, I'll be like, okay, look, like, I'll give you 48 hours to review it. If I don't hear back from you, then... We'll run it. That's if I do hear back from you, then we can have a discussion. That's smart. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not going to let you hold it forever and hold up the whole project. But my whole thing is, I feel I'm at the point that it shouldn't be like, uh, we just don't work with that outlet at all. It's like, all right, we can have discussions. We could, we could figure things out. There's ultimately a business. But all my inter- I don't remember the last time a label gave me an interview with an artist that's on a promo tour, unless it's an artist that no one's ever heard about. And then they'll hit you up out of the blue. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, here's this guy with 10,000 views. Can you interview him? But it's like, why not just, because I feel like there's so many lit artists outside of the label. Like, Of course there is. But, but, but you want, you know, you, you want both. Now, if it's like, look, these guys are doing Good Morning America, Pierce Morgan, and 60 Minutes. All right. I, I get why I'm not in that conversation. But if you're doing Breakfast Club big boy on the radio, why am I not in this conversation? Because my YouTube numbers are as big as all these guys, if not bigger, on, on a regular basis. Like, well, I'm not going to lie. That's why when I was doing interviews for you, people would be like, hey, just so you know, we're pulling up for you. Like, I was helping you kind of yeah. get the industry back on like, all right, you know, he, he isn't so bad. Because at the end of the day, I do have a lot of respect for you. And like, likewise, I understand the reputation thing and people calling you the feds and whatnot, but working with you, like, I know that's not your intention. Like, it's never anyone's intention to actually affect someone's human life. Right. You know? Yeah, I mean, and, and I've always been, I think, the biggest proponent of helping the next generation of interviewers come up. One day you're going to mention me whenever you name all these motherfuckers, by the way. I think that everyone, when you look at everyone that's in position, they've leaned into exactly who they are yeah. and they're they're unapologetic about it academics will get into it with everybody with anybody and he won't stop and he'll go <laughs> to the extreme with it math hoffa is that battle rap guy it's, it's you know the whole ambiance of a of a barber shop that's all very crafted on their end so they get a certain type of interview and a certain type of vibe. You know, I just got to do uh, Drink Champs and I got to see exactly Miami. how they laid it out. They don't do remote interviews. You have to be in Miami at this particular spot. Walking away from it, I'm like, okay, I get it now. I get why Drink Champs is Drink Champs because it is a vibe that they craft to get these types of uh, interviews. So you got to lean into it. You, there's got to be something that's so drastically different about what you do and you do it over and over again until yeah. people know that like, I feel like when you watch a Vlad TV interview, you know what it's going to be about before you watch it. Yeah. Right. 
people talk their shit. Oh shit, you know, just we had this photo of Michael Vick that went viral, like five, six million views uh, on Twitter. And it's just like, oh shit, my, Michael going back to jail. Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh no. Like, like it, it's the joke, but people know that, okay, if, if they watch this interview, we're going to go into some of this stuff. So it, it's, you know, you got to lean into who you are. And w- once you do that, it takes time. It takes years. You got to take a smoke break. Shout out to the standard cannabis. This is the newest hash light. Uh-huh. 1.2 grams of flour, 0.3 grams of ice water hash. And you see how... It has a little top. Yeah. Pop it off like a champagne bottle. And you're ready. You want to spark it? Sure. And just so you know, smoking probably doesn't help the algorithm when it comes to YouTube. Oh, my God. You know God. what I'm saying? So you're going to have to just keep it 100. But the reality is that you limit yourself to more of an adult audience when you're smoking. It's not like everything you do has to involve smoking. Like, for example, if you look, we're, we're doing a lot of different shit. The, the biggest clip of 2023 was the Boosie House Tour. Yeah, I knew you did that. That's fire. But then we did the Boosie House tour. We did LeVar Ball's house. Oh, wow. I just got back from Miami again. I did Deion Dawkins. He's wow. uh, the captain of the Buffalo Bills. He has like a $17 million house. Wow. In, a, in Miami with a million dollar boat in the back. Uh, we did car features. Uh, DJ Vanilla Envy, Ice. Vanilla Ices, car collection. Uh, and we did our first restaurant feature right here in LA uh, with Blood Souls Barbecue. Yeah, I saw that too. Which was like our first ever me going to a restaurant. Nice. Yeah. So it, it's. Are you saying branch out and do more shit? You got to experiment. You being Shirley Jew could do a restaurant in LA with no budget. They'd be happy to have have you there promoting their restaurant. But you got to pay free. the videographer, the editor. See, you have people on staff for that. I don't. Right. This is, this is where a sponsor might come in. Who loves blazing? Because I do. Blazy Susan has been a go-to since I started smoking. They are widely recognized for their world-famous vegan pink papers. They're founded in Denver, Colorado and have remained a staple in the cannabis community, creating extra functional rolling trays, organizers, and smoking accessories. My favorite color is purple. It's also the theme to Shirley's Temple. Blazy Susan's line of purple cones was designed to raise mental health awareness with profits going towards groups like the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Make sure you follow Blazy Susan on Instagram and check out BlazySusan.com. You brought up the whole female thing. I do feel like in the entertainment industry, sometimes it can be hard being a female. So I just want to point out that incident on social media, dragging two females. I, I look at it as I'm having a situation with two music industry professionals. But we didn't do anything. Well, the, the Warner Brothers girl did. She's like the nicest human being. I, I, I like, understand she's nice to you, but ultimately I've been blocked from every Warner Brothers artist. You know what I'm saying? But, but at the end of the day, I kind of look at it as we, we, have to, we have to stand on our professional accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's really what we have. We could always fall back to gender, to race, to religion, to age, to whatever. But ultimately we have to stand on who we are professionally. And, and, when dealing with another person professionally, that's what I focus on. And I've gotten into it with males and females, straight, gay, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, it's, to me, it's whatever. Like if we're, we're all in this fishbowl of, in the music industry and we all have to stand behind our shit. I've, I've never said, well, it's because I'm white. You know, ever, ever in life. I've never felt like I'm not here because I'm white. I don't pull the race card either. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, I don't pull the gender card. I don't pull the age card. I, I'm 50 years old. You know, I know I'm older than the majority of hip hop media. And that's cool. I, I saw I, you I started Vlad TV at 34 recently. And I was 34. Like, yeah. 34. I have, I have hope. I just turned 33. But anyways. I, I mean, it, it's just that uh, we all, we all have to stand on our, what we, what we've pulled off. It, it's very easy to turn everything into race, gender, whatever. Whenever I make like, when I made my comments about Taraji P. Henson and the whole uh, salary thing, the first thing is turned into, Vlad is white and shouldn't be allowed to even comment on this. And that, oh, that, that, that. that's what it devolves into initially. And, and that, that to me is sort of like the, the, the annoying part of, of debates. It's like, we're not talking about all the, all the extra shit. We're talking about what's happening right now. Right. But. Okay. But. Incidents. Like the Taraji P. Henson thing, do you sometimes feel like you have blind spots? Like you're not really aware that what you say could have consequences? I, I'm always aware that, I'm always aware that this is an unpopular opinion and people are gonna criticize me for the opinion. And uh, 
Because that's a black queen. I love, and I've said multiple times, I love Taraji as an actress in pretty much every movie she's ever done. From Baby Boy to Benjamin Button to Hidden Figures to everything. She kills it every single time. But I feel like you also, you guys are in like the same bracket. Like y'all are both. Well, you know? so it just felt like. What, what, and what I said was this, was like at the age that she's at, as opposed to being frustrated that she's not getting paid what it is that she feels she deserves. We all just like, none of us feel that we get what we deserve. Right? <laughs> like right now, sure. I could bet that you feel underpaid. Every day, every day, every I'm day, trying to figure out why. every day, you're fi- trying to figure out why this person over here is getting paid more than you, That's and you're cool. not exactly sure why because you're hustling and grinding your ass off. Because I've had moments like this. You got to understand that Vlad TV started at 34, but six years before I moved to New York to become a DJ and started at the very, very bottom, backpack full of CDs that I would leave on consignment. Damn, how old were you? 29. I turned 30 in New York. At 29, I, I up in my I whole life. I actually love that you're a hip hop head. And moved to New York, was homeless and slept on couches until I had enough money to get a little studio apartment in Brooklyn. And I just grinded CDs and I sort of figured out my way in this industry. You know what I'm saying? And it's, um, there's, there's a whole process that goes into that. What were you doing right before that? I had went to school at UC Berkeley. Smart as hell. I got rejected. <laughs> you got rejected? <laughs> yeah, I got into UC Santa Barbara. I got into UC Santa Barbara and UC Davis. I got rejected from Davis and I was hurt. Oh, I was really? Like, oh. Davis was like going to be my next choice if I didn't get into Berkeley. I got into Berkeley. I majored in computer science. That's like the hard- Yo, can I just tell you, I took a computer science class in college. Yeah. And I swear to God, I was like, this is the hardest shit I've ever had to take. That shit is yeah, not it's easy. hard. So I respect anybody. It's hard. There's a lot of math, linear algebra and all types of other weird, yeah. obs- obscure math shit that you got to do for 3D graphics and all that was a lot. So I was studying computer science, but I was also kind of getting my feet wet in hip hop. I was making beats and, and doing demos and working with local rappers and nice. stuff like that. And I graduated. I was a programmer for a little while. And I actually started a company uh, where we recruited key engineers for a lot of these startup companies. You know what I mean? So I was like a headhunter, I guess. Oh, you know? wow. And I had my own company. We had office, everything else like that. And we were, that was the first time I made like real money. Where, because sometimes you would get paid 25, 30, 35,000 to just get someone a job. Yeah. It was a really rewarding position also. And I was doing that. And then in 2000, the whole dot-com crash just happened out of nowhere. And all the companies I was working with all went out of business. So I had this kind of moment in my life where I was like, I could go different directions. I could go back to, wow. to tech. I can maybe go to law school or I could try this DJ thing because I had been starting to do it and making beats and, yeah. you know, DJing and stuff like that. Like, all right, like I'm 29. I'm not going to have a window in time again for the rest of my life to really try out my dreams and see yeah. where they take me. Like at 50, I can't say, hey, I'm going to be a DJ now. Like, you know, if I was an engineer for 50 years, like yeah. no one's going to take me seriously, right? I could be a DJ now because of my history, you know, I can yeah. go back to it, but I can't be a brand new DJ. It's, it's silly. Yeah. I knew in my lifespan, this was the last time. So I said, all right, let me move to New York and try the DJ thing, try the mixtape thing and see if I could really do the hip hop thing for a living. And uh, it was with really nothing with no resources. Just trying to figure it out because yeah. I was living in the Bay at the time. Yeah. So I moved from Oakland to New York. How was that? Cold? It was, it was hard. Really yeah, cold. it was cold. No, not cold like New York. It doesn't oh, okay. snow in the Bay. It'd be cold in the Bay. Yeah, it doesn't snow in the Bay. Yeah. And, and I never lived in San Francisco where it got like cold, cold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was rough. It was just like you don't quite know when you're going to sort of stabilize. It's always a very unstable existence where one bad phone bill or your car breaking down just throws off everything in your life and you're trying to figure it out. And, uh, but like, like I I remember the low point was I was working at this, like this dead strip club in Brooklyn. I heard, I know you worked over 40 jobs and I remember you talking about this strip club. This fucked up strip club. That sounds brutal. And the owner yelled at me in front of all the girls. And I'm looking at this motherfucker like, you you just don't know who who I am and who I'm going to be. And I get it. Because I'm just this guy that's doing an unskilled job right now. Because playing at a strip club was not a skilled job. 
And I get why you don't feel like you got to respect me on any level. But I know who I'm going to be. So I'm out. That's <laughs> and that was, and that was the, the last, I just realized I got to get, I, I got to get on my focus because all the strip club shit, whatever local club shit is just taking me away from what I need to figure out how to do. This is just money not well earned. It's time for the power hitter. Okay, what is this? So this is a new seamless way to share joints without sharing germs. This is going to blow your mind. Okay. And shout out to the standard cannabis. We're smoking the tree rolls. Okay. Are you ready though? So this is what it looks like. How much do you smoke in a day, bud? Uh, I don't smoke that much. I'm trying to actually smoke less. I probably like a joint a day. Do you work in smoke or no? I can, I can work in smoke. Oh, I can't. Okay. So you just hold the carb. You see? Oh. So it's supposed to like. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you got to hold your thumb under the carb. So their slogan is. <laughs> don't lip it. Just. Grip it and rip it. It's lit, right? That's interesting. Clap it up, clap it up. Shout out to the power hitter. So in light of the Super Bowl this weekend, we got you the football power hitter. Okay. You know? <laughs> Who you got, Vlad? Niners? Oh, you know, you know, it's the Niners. Okay. Come on. Yeah, I'm, I'm from go. the Bay. Come on right. now. <laughs> Please hit it on Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. That'd be really fun. And then yeah. here's the standard cannabis for you to... Put the joint inside. Oh, okay. You want to go open? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I'll open it. Look into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just, I really appreciate their packaging and their, but be careful. I don't know if you smoked a hash hole, but the hash holes are very strong. Woo. All right. All right. So, you know, Shirley Temple has to focus on mental health. How is your mental health? Uh, I think it's pretty good. I think it's decent. Yeah. I don't think I'm going through any kind of lows or highs right now. Yeah. Good. I love to share some statistics. Mm -hmm. That resonated with me. Okay, so if you work in the entertainment industry, chances are you've experienced some sort of mental health issue. What per percentage of performers do you think suffer from depression, anxiety, or burnout? I, I don't know. I think I, the cool thing about what we do is you ultimately, you, you control your own schedule most times. Yeah, you have to work with other people, but... I think it's different from having to do a nine to five as opposed to Absolutely. like being able to sort of pick and choose. Like, hey, I'm not going to drop an album for a year. I'm not going to tour. You, you, you see this a lot. Yeah. I'm not going to do as many interviews. I'm not going to go to these events. I'm going to chill. And I, I think I've, I've learned that over the years where, where I used to be like every night, out, 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 out. Like every event. Every All Star Weekend, every Grammy this, every BET that, yeah, I used to be there and so forth. And now it's like, all right, a lot, a lot of that is not necessary, as necessary. It's always good. There's never a downside to it. Yeah, uh, but it's not as necessary, and you have to really kind of keep your. I think that's a way to keep your mental health by knowing that you don't have to chase after everything. Right. You know, ease into where where you are and what you're good at. Was there a time where you were always out and had to be out? Or? Absolutely. Yeah, you think, yeah, I mean, when I moved to New York, it was like, yo. Oh, yeah, the grind. I'm, I'm not here to sit in my apartment. I'm not here to, to sit on this couch at someone else's house. Like, I got to be out every night. And a lot of these relationships that I have started a long time ago. Me and Sean Prez, who's my main interviewer, we met in 2003, like a year after I had moved in. So the, the big, the first time I had a big project was this uh, Big E mixtape called uh, Big E Rap Phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the mixtape world is not really what it is, but back then it was kind of a big deal. We and, love the mixtape days. You know, it was it was the first project that MTV ever mentioned on, on the actual MTV TV. And uh, Sean Prez was managing the other DJ, uh, Dirty Harry. And that's kind of how I met Sean Prez. Oh, wow. During that time. He was, already, he was working with Bad Boy as well. It was like, yeah, I mean, this is a relationship that goes back 20, yeah, over 20 years. Wow. Literally. So, you know, it's cool that we get to work together now. All right. So this is from MJ Arsenal. They're a leader in compact and functional glassware designed to elevate your smoking and dabbing experience. You got your lighter? Yeah. And then they have, this is the cachet bong. Look, they have a little flower stash. Can you smoke out of bong? Not really. So, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll smoke on camera. Why not? Right? Why not? So, okay, so hold on. So this is the carbs you put? Oh, no, 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 no. That's just a stash jar. So you just- Is, is there a carb it? or no? 
uh, you light the bowl and then you pull the you bowl out. You pull it out. out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm bucking. Yeah. Pots. So Pots. yeah, I, I've used to like the, the hole on the side. <laughs> hey. He smokes. This is the college thing. Like when I first got to Berkeley. Oh my gosh. Y'all were so, oh yeah. I was, introdu- I was introduced to bongs for the first time in life. Yeah. Oh my god. That's when I first saw bongs. Because around growing up in San Mateo, it was like joints. Yeah. But I didn't really smoke either. You know. Yeah. But did you listen to Cypress Hill hits from the bong? Th- that was, I felt like the first hip hop group that made smoking cool. Absolutely. That's a fucking legend. It had been obviously mentioned before by NWA and stuff like that. Well, NWA yeah. was dissing it actually. Express Yourself was an anti-marijuana song. Wow. Only for Dre to come out with the chronic. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah, Cypress Hill. Well, made everyone want to smoke weed. Perfect timing, because I'm going to give you this little bong from okay. DJ Arsenal. Thank you. Um, but definitely shout out to Be Real. There's this photo, if you can find it on my Instagram, where it was the first time I was backstage at their concert. Because I had really just gotten to know them around that time. And my head was shaved. And there's a picture of us, and we look like twins. And it's so <laughs> crazy. Like, both, like, we really look like brothers Damn. In, in this photo. Because we... we we do look a little similar in a weird type of way. Yeah. Cypress Hill. A big thing in my life. For sure. Yeah. How excited were you to interview him? Uh, it was dope. It, it was absolutely dope. There's one thing, like, once you get in the industry, you get kind of jaded. Because then you start to get to know the actual people. And sometimes these aren't people that you end up getting along with. And, yeah. And whatever, whatever, right? But when you're just a fan, you're just listening to the music. And it's just pure. I love the music and this makes me feel a certain type of way and I want to keep hearing it over and over again. And you never think you're actually going to meet the person. I was in the, the Cypress Hill Insane in the Brain music video. Oh, wow. Uh, but it's not like I got to meet Be Real or any yeah. of those guys back then. Uh, but to actually then meet them, you change numbers, you have some level of relationship and sure. you, you, they do your show, you do their show. Yeah. Multiple times. It's like, yo, like this is this is dope. It's like one of my heroes. Yeah, literally, I'm not gonna lie. I booked for B Rose podcast now. Oh it's yeah. It's probably my favorite gig I've ever had. It's just like and also their podcast is fucking dope. Like Yeah, everyone loves Be Real. Right? It makes it easy. So I'm gonna read you another statistic. Depression is a highly treatable mental illness. Um, approximately how much percentage of individuals respond favorably to treatment? which typically consists of medication, psychotherapy, or a combination of both? Maybe 60%? 80 to 90. 80 to 90, okay. Yeah. A few years ago, you mentioned you were depressed. Yeah. How are you managing it now, and what do you do for your mental health? I went to go see a therapist. Okay. When I, when I was... Uh, we support yeah. therapy over here. Yeah, when I was uh, going through it, I said, all right, let me take it into... I can't keep functioning like this. Yeah. I can't keep going through this crisis mode emotionally. Let me go get a professional. So I remember doing some Google searches about like celebrity therapists. Damn, he said he needed a celebrity well, therapist, well, y'all. Not not because I feel that I'm a I'm a celebrity, but it's just that I think there's certain things that I go through that other public people go through. And someone who's dealt with public people would understand what I'm going through as opposed to someone who's never met a person who's a public person. I feel a lot of therapists, you know, especially outside of L.A., probably have no, are just dealing with regular working people. For sure. We have our own set of situations. Hardships. Yeah. Whether people feel it's a big deal or not, it is what it is. So I went and found a guy and uh, it's fine. I'm not going to say who it is, but. One of the people I interviewed last year, we had the same therapist because we kind of ran into oh each other. Oh my God. Yeah. We ran into each other as he was leaving and I was coming in. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah it just kind of helped me through a difficult time. And uh, at one point I felt I was good. I didn't need a therapist uh, to deal with it, but it was, uh, it was helpful because a lot of times you just don't always have a person that you could talk to about your problems. And sometimes you don't want to talk to a person about your problems because then that could be used against you right. as well in its own way. So having someone whose job it is to hear about your problems and is legally not allowed to share that with other people yeah. is, is a big deal. And, and it should be utilized whenever, whenever you need it. And there okay. are low-cost solutions to this and free solutions and apps and stuff like that. Uh, I feel like 
Man, I feel like therapy is expensive if you don't have insurance. And sometimes even if you have insurance. You should have insurance, though. We, we all should have insurance. Before you buy an outfit, before you, you go out to a restaurant, you should have insurance. For sure. You should, everyone should have insurance. Before you invest, <laughs> you should have insurance. If you invest in stocks and you don't have insurance, you're, you're doing it backwards. Yeah. So, so you should absolutely have insurance. Every full-time employee of Live TV has medical insurance. Wow. And that's something we've had for a lot of years now. Because I feel like that, what else do you have if you don't have your health? Yeah. That, that's, that's the most important thing in your life. How much have you made off stocks? <laughs> I've done well. Still? Yeah, I've, I've kicked ass. Last year was my biggest year in terms of just pure profit. Now, the year like, before, How do you have time to do stocks and buy TV? Stocks doesn't require a lot of time. Oh. I, I sort of, I have like three stocks and I don't touch them. Oh. I, I buy more like Tesla is one of my stocks. It went down recently. I bought more. It doesn't require a lot of Why time. Why did it go down recently? There, there's always something that's going on with Elon. Right. <laughs> something crazy. So that affects the stock price radically. That's so, hilarious. yeah, it, it doesn't take a lot of time. Real stock investing is boring. You don't really do much. You make the most on dividends? No. No. Uh, okay. I don't I have don't, any. I'm not about well, that. I have, yeah. I have uh, like my 401ks <laughs> all in S&P 500. So that there's dividends for that. But when I say I make money, I don't sell any of my stocks. So technically, I didn't make anything. It's all on paper, but this is a way of, of building your wealth right. over time. Like if you don't sell your house, your house could be worth twice as much. You haven't right. sold it. So technically that's just on paper, but it's the same type of thing. How did it feel buying that house? Felt good. You got people in your community? Yeah. A lot of celebrities in my community. Can you say any or no? Uh, John Sally. Oh, he's, he, a, he's a neighbor. He, he literally goes to Alok, which is a vegan restaurant. Right yeah. here on First Street he's all the vegan. time. Yeah, he's, you don't tell me he's driving from Calabasas. He is, yeah, he is, absolutely. In a Tesla. That's <laughs> wild. Yeah. Like I the first two times at All Lock, I ran into him there and he was with his daughters. Yeah. I was like, that's so sweet. Yeah. Uh Dia Hughley is another one of my neighbors. Oh wow. Yeah. Everyone pretty much respects each other's privacy. For sure. Yeah. In a gated community, you actually have everyone understands what it is. Yeah. People are just popping. I up. heard you have a really big closet. I got a, yeah, I got a massive closet. <laughs> it's insane. I want a big closet. <laughs> yeah, it's like U-shaped. It goes around. So like there's like a hallway to the closet with like closet stuff on both Would sides. Would you ever let someone do a crib tour with you? Nah, I'm good. Because you're private? I'm private. Yeah, not my thing. Maybe one day. Right. Just it's not right Shirley now. Sample, MTV Cribs edition. All right, so I got to give you these. These are from d Edibles. Oh, so edibles. So these are vegan, first of all, because your girl's vegan. There are, I want you to go through the flavors. Have you been to Thailand? I have. Ooh, how did, did you like it? I did. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, town's dope. Right? Went to uh, Bangkok and Pattaya. I love it. So tell me you don't feel Thailand Ooh, when you see jackfruit. those. jackfruit. Okay. Right? So it's actually from the same owner of Sluggers. His name is Josh. Pineapple. He moved to Thailand on a whim and instantly fell in love with the culture there. So this is like a truly authentic Thai experience that you're getting. Okay. Is weed legal in Thailand? Is weed legal in Thailand? Also, they have their new uh, disposable vapes. Disposable vapes? Yeah, so you could just puff it and taste it right here. So you just puff it? Doesn't that taste amazing? Mm. Right? I just remember moving to LA and, and coming from out of New York and moving to LA and weed was legal, but I wasn't really supposed to get access into these stores because I didn't have a, a license, oh. a driver's license yet. It wasn't fully recreational yet. But right. I just remember buying legal weed for the first time when I used to live in Hollywood. And she's like, damn, like I'm going to a store and buying weed. I don't have to meet with a sketchy I felt weed like that. dealer. I feel like my first memory of that is like med men. Like being able to pay for weed on a credit card. Yeah. It was like, oh it's shit. wild. Walking in front of a cop with weed in your hands, not thinking that something might happen. Right. It was... Uh, and just the quality was so much better. Yeah. You, you didn't know what the fuck you were getting. But the weed yeah. man, especially these days, they got fentanyl and that shit. Like, thank weed, God. Like, that's terrible. Yeah, do you like edibles, though? I don't really do edibles too much. But I, these I, are so good. You're I had a be bad like, trip this one time. Okay, yeah. Everyone has a bad trip. <laughs> I hate it because it'd be keeping me up. My uh, mind is racing. Yeah, on, a, on a plane to uh, Brazil, I had a cookie. And I was distinctly told not to eat the whole cookie. Oh, no. I was told by the guy that sold me the cookie 
don't eat the whole cookie. Was it from Berkeley? Because they be making their edibles. I, I forgot like, where where it was from where it was from, but it was from the store. And he told me not to eat the whole cookie. And I was at the airport, and I'm like, shit. If I throw away half a cookie, I'm technically dropping weed off, and uh, <laughs> so I might as well just eat the whole cookie. <laughs> I me too. I can't waste. So I, anything. I ate the whole cookie, and I remember getting in my seat, and things were started to go ballistic. Like, oh no! I was seeing like. Tigers and dragons and shit. And How long <laughs> is the flight to Brazil? It's a long ass flight. It's like a seven hour, nine hour flight, some shit. Like, oh it's my. a lot. But I just remember saying like, I'm, there was definitely a feeling that if I just started to talk to, to the guy next to me, <laughs> I might have to be escorted off the plane. <laughs> so I was just have to just, just keep quiet. I'm dead. <laughs> just keep quiet and just let it pass. And I think I slept it off. Okay, eventually. good. But yeah, I remember after that, I said, damn, edibles are no joke. Literally, that happens to me. Like, I feel like every time, I, it's like an accident that you overdose. It's like, yeah, you know? But I was going to ask, because I know uh, you actually lost 30 pounds beginning of COVID. Yeah. How did you change your lifestyle? I, uh, well, first I started counting calories. Okay. That, that was by far the biggest change. You got to really understand what it is that you're putting into your body and the amount that you should be putting in. So it, For sure. right off the bat, it was like, I put in my age, my weight, my height, that like, cool. You could eat roughly 2000 calories a day. That's if you, it. If you go over, you're going to gain weight. If you go under, you're going to start losing weight. So I'm like, all right. Oh. And then if you work out, however many calories you burn, that goes into the equation, right? But for me in the beginning, it was just mostly the food. And uh, I was like, all right, let me see if I could eat under 2000 and really understand so I never really counted calories before I really looked at, at certain foods. Yeah. I just got it. The weight just started to come off. And then to this day, I'm always sort of thinking about calories in my head whenever I'm eating. And then I started, uh, I also started to work out every morning on my treadmill. Like I play video games. Oh on my, my gosh. Treadmill. Uh, How do you? I could just zone out. That well, sounds... you can only do certain kinds of games. You can okay. do like turn based games. You can't play like Fortnite. You're going to end up falling. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, know? wait. Yeah, you can't play certain kinds, like action games, you can't do it. Yeah. But certain games where it's just you do a turn and then something else happens, Yeah. like card games or stuff like that, you could play and then I could just zone out. And then before I know it, hour, hour and a half passes, I'll burn. Like I burned a thousand calories a couple of days ago. Nice. I was on a treadmill for like two, two hours and some change. I like Are a you high. Run? Oh, you're, okay. I'm walking, I'm walking. Okay. I do like a three miles per hour, but I do like a high incline, like four and a half, five, Yeah. sometimes six. Yeah, two hours in video games. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I had that tweet that went crazy over, I know, over I see, video games, yeah. but I'm doing it while I'm working out. I'm on the treadmill. Sure. I'm not sitting on my couch with a soda yeah. playing video games. I'm actually healthier by the time I finish that game. Was video games ever a factor? Man, a video game is always there for you. Uh, <laughs> it's always there. I don't play video games, so I It's always there can't. to lift up your day. And it offers nothing, weird. nothing in return. You know, you'll get happy winning something, oh, whatever. Okay. It's like, but you got to get, you got to get dopamine. back. Yeah. The dopamine triggers and stuff like that. Unless you're making money off of it or you're working out doing it, you walk away with nothing, just the memory of it. And I think that's cool every so often, but I've definitely started playing a lot of video games during my depressive stage. Yeah. I would just like for 10 hours straight, I would just play. Yeah. You know, I just get a new game and then just put my whole life into it. Do you have a favorite right now? Not really. Okay. I, I play I play Slay the Spire and Civilization, which are two fairly old games, but I can just make time pass on a treadmill very quickly. Right. When, when I play those. Right. Because I just zone out because I know them so well. But now I don't. To me, I'd rather spend that time watching an interview. I got to. Well, you know something? For? What I'm also doing is what I started doing recently is I started listening to uh, audiobooks. As while I'm you're playing video while games? While I'm playing video games and I'm on the treadmill. This and I'm is listening, why you're like. I'm listening to an audiobook at the same time. Yeah. So, for example. This is like three things. Three things oh at once. Oh my God, my mind can't right, handle it. Right, So like, for example, like like the Jada Pinkett, her book, I just read it. Oh, how was it? It was pretty good. I mean, you hear a lot of the the craziness pretty much in her interviews. It wasn't a big shock. I love uh, Jada. But it talked about the whole Will Smith slapping incident and everything else oh, like wow, that. Oh, wow, okay. Talked about Tupac. Yeah. Uh, you know, everything else like that. So for example, yeah, so her book is an example. Or uh, Bob Iger, who is the CEO of Disney. I just yeah. read his autobiography, you know, listened to his autobiography. And I listened to it at like double speed so I can get through oh, it relatively nice. fast. Yeah. 
But you're literally playing video games at the same time. Yes, yeah, so I'm listening. I'm playing is, a video game no, there's on no the way. treadmill and listening to an audio book. I can barely just listen double, to an audio uh, podcast. Uh, double speed. That's yeah. insane. Yeah, I listen to double speed. Every so often I'll have my, like what I did is since I have a treadmill at my house. You take Adderall? No, I don't do pills at all. <laughs> Uh, I had the treadmill at my house and I actually put a like table on top of the treadmill and kind of strapped it in. It's like, it was designed for like treadmills. Wow. So every so often I'll have my laptop right there on the treadmill and I'll like, I'll be listening to like, let's say I'm doing research. I'll be listening to a so podcast. I'll take, write the, notes. write the notes down. So yeah. I don't, I don't forget. And uh, yeah. So it's, I have like a little treadmill office in, in a way. <laughs> this is for your crib. So this is from Smoke Odor Candles. These um, eliminate the weed smoke after you smoke. Oh, yeah. So, but you got to smell one of them because they smell amazing. Honestly, they're my favorite. Oh, okay. Right? It's like a, like a cinnamon yes. kind of, is that what this is? Well, I don't know if you be smoking when you're traveling, but the sprays are clutch in hotels and rental cars. But yeah, these are genuinely my favorite candles. You mentioned Tupac, so obviously yeah. mm -hmm. we have to talk about Tupac. To me, I interviewed you for Variety. And I asked you, like, I think what was your favorite interview you've done or, like, what was the most meaningful? And you literally said the Keefe D interview. Yeah. And thank you for that interview. That was a big look for me. You know what, Vlad? You know, I, we met at THC Design. And right before the interview, I got in a car accident. Oh. Literally, like, my car was fucked up. And I, I, I literally you, you told me about that, yeah. had to hold it together because I was so excited. Because as a freelance writer, like, it's really hard to, like, get the articles you want placed. Yeah. So the fact that my editor said yes, I was hyped. Yeah. So Keefe D is currently locked up based on his involvement in the Tupac murder. And uh, what year did you interview him? It was four years ago, 2020. He, he wrote a book. At the same time that I did the interview, he was putting his book out. So we actually had a copy of the book leading up to the interview. So someone from your car That's what I started shooting at Tupac and Shook. Basically, yeah. My thing was, let's, once and for all, I'm going to take you through what happened when Tupac got killed. The crazy part to me is, like, Keefe D, like, being down. <laughs> he, he wrote a book. He had some level of legal protection, which is a proffer agreement, which doesn't hold after you leave that day. So if you choose to retell a story, you could get prosecuted for it. But he chose to write a book and do interviews about it. He was an older man. I believe he had cancer at the time. I don't know if he still does. And I felt like Tupac being the biggest rapper of all time. I know everyone has their favorites. But if you go from a bird's eye view of the whole hip hop genre worldwide, you'd be hard pressed to find a person that has a bigger impact even right now than Tupac. For sure. We've lost a lot of hip hop greats. Nobody's on a Tupac level. And uh, here is my chance to tell the story of his passing through the only person that was actually there that was responsible for it and take us through the whole process. He had written a book, so I felt like it was all fair game. You write a book, I'm going to ask you about the book. How did you get in contact with him? There was someone I know that knows him as well, and they connected us. I'm not going to say who it is because they probably don't want me in the middle of this shit. Yeah. But it, it was it was a, a rapper Got it. That, that I know. But yeah, he connected us, and uh, he agreed to do it. We we knocked it out, and then you know a lot of years passed. He did a lot of other interviews about the same topic until uh, Las Vegas PD felt like they had a case. How did it feel when they contacted you? I felt like I didn't really realize how big it was until like Pierce Morgan reached out to me and wanted to do an interview and suddenly every big media outlet started to reach out. I, I had already solved it. I had already then. solved it in my head. Yeah. So to me, it was like, okay, y'all, y'all are just late. Okay, that's fine. That's crazy. Uh, but it was never my intention to try to get him arrested or try to get him in jail. So when Las Vegas PD called me, I said, well, I didn't, I just didn't respond. Yeah. And they kept calling. They kept leaving voicemails. They started emails and whatever else. And it's just like, well, I don't have to cooperate. It's not a requirement that I cooperate. Yeah. And there's no legal basis of them forcing me to cooperate. Right. All they want is essentially all the raw footage, hoping there was something else he said off camera or something, something, something. Right. You bring up a lot that Keefe D might not get convicted. What do you foresee happening? If he could prove that 
he was just getting a check and he was making all this up because he was trying to make money off the situation and he needed the money. It's not like he was rich and whatever. He, he needed Does the money. Does it come down to their legal teams? Like, Yeah. It's up to his lawyer to try to convince a... That's a lot to have your A jury. Stuff. Yeah, to convince a jury that all this was made up. Right. But you never know. That's you never know how cool. trials go. Maybe... At some point, Las Vegas PD might just say, this is an old man and this is an old case and let's just give him time served. I mean, it took them four years to arrest him. Yeah, about that. Until when he started to go public. Because he also went public in a, in a BT interview. Oh, he did after B- you? It might have been before me, but it was oh. just a small part in a bigger oh. piece. Uh, and that's going to be a problem for him as well. You know, if you choose to talk about a murder willingly you're going to have to hold whatever comes with it. Yeah. Well, perfect timing for Al Capone. This timing is impeccable, guys. So this is a gift from Al Capone. This is a little flask. But if you want to go through the box, um, they make premium leaf wraps. And they have cigars. They're really big on the East Coast. Um, There's an electronic lighter in there for you. You're never going to want another lighter again. Is it like a blowtorch? Yeah. How do you know? You have one? I mean, I've definitely checked these out before. Uh Whoa. (laughs) How do you like this? Um, I think there's a button, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. There we go. Oh. Isn't that cool? Sheesh. Okay. Right? Okay. Dope. According to the World Health Organization, 10 million Ukrainians suffer from mental health conditions like depression or anxiety. Outside of the 10 million, 4 million may have cases that are moderate or severe. Mm-hmm. 10 million is a lot of people. Yeah, how do you feel about that statistic? I mean, imagine if there was war on the outskirts of LA right now. Right. Think about think about how well we'd be holding up right now. Think about every so often a drone comes in and just blows some shit up. Uh, Did you see? Do missiles, you remember anything? Missiles hit. Well, you, you I, I was, I was four. Five. I was yeah, four. I know. And and at that time, like a lot of people, because I've always said that I was Russian because at the time it was part of Russia. Yeah. It was part of the USSR, so technically it was Russia. It became independent after I moved out, so I'm sort of in a weird in between state when it comes to who I am in terms of my what country I'm from, technically two different countries. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's fucked up. I was, I was a kid when we left, but to know that this is happening and I don't, I haven't really seen from the very beginning a way for the Ukraine to really win this situation because they're, they're, they're just so overpowered by such a much bigger country with way more money, way more military, whatever else. U.S. is getting tired. I believe the U.S. Has stopped funding after this last batch. And it's just like, I think ultimately the, ne- the inevitable is going to happen. And, and it's sad, and but I think it just is what it is at this point. And I, th- this thing has been going for so long because America and other countries have been funding it. Yeah. At some point, like that money's going to run out. And yeah. then what? And I think we're reaching the and then what part right. right now. So, Do you feel like your roots in Ukraine, like does that play a role sometimes in your mental health like yeah i mean but i don't i don't have any more family there okay i was gonna ask so so yeah all my family either moved or died okay essentially so everyone on my father's side they didn't move they passed away yeah they made some of them may move to germany i think they they settled over there we don't have anyone out there anymore that i know of Uh, i probably do have relatives out there to some capacity but not any that i even know exists so it's just like you know I, I was born there yeah so, so you, you you have to recognize that part yeah you know for a long time i had a ukrainian flag uh, in my bio on twitter but oh wow yeah it, it's at some point the reality of the situation is gonna yeah. is gonna hit and we're gonna see what happens in the, in the next couple of months how was it coming to the states at five though like as a five-year-old you adapt right so i don't think i have a russian accent I adapted to America pretty quickly. My parents had accents and they never really meshed into American society yeah. the same way that I did, which is, that's why they didn't really, I don't think, understand what, what it right. is that I do. But yeah, I, I meshed and I became an American. They kind of, you know, I mean, think about it. If you, if you come in, imagine if you move to, if you move to Paris right now, you wouldn't really mesh into French society completely. Yeah. Where you just listen to French music and whatever else. You'd probably hold on to some American friends that might be For living sure. over there and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what happened. I came in, I came up as an American kid with American friends, American right. schools, American universities, American music. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I think it was it was cool for me. It's not as like the, the people that came a little bit later in life. It, it was hard for them. Is this what you always wanted to do, or did you just see yourself? It was what I always wanted to do. This is a bit of a surprise. Like, like I'm always thinking about how this wasn't the plan in high school on any capacity. Not even really in college. By chance, I kind of stumbled into DJing. And when I started to DJ and, and do that type of performance, it really hit me as to how dope that was. And how I started to think that I, I could be one of the best at this. And, you know, and this is the, the delusion of, of everyone who tries to make it on any level. Like, I'm going to be the best at mixtapes, I said. From there, things sort of evolved. They evolved into media and me doing interviews and stuff like that was sort of once again, by chance, and just by a weird set of events. You have to also look at shit realistically. You have to say, I'm not going to be the world's best uh, DJ. Like, there's people that are so much better than me, and they're, they're always going to be above where I would want to be. But there's certain things I, I could be the best at. So I felt like in interviewing, I could potentially be the best, and I started to focus on what it is that I felt I could be great at. Yeah. And... and, and a lot of the a lot of the success is based on quitting when you, you still kind of want to hold on, but you know deep down that you're not great at this. Yeah. You should be doing something else. Right. And you should you need to just cut ties and go on to the next thing. How long until you touch your first million from YouTube? Uh it it was it was some years. It it wasn't quickly. I mean, obviously, but how many? <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. I'm not even being funny. See, the thing is, making a million is not exactly a milestone because a lot of money has to be spent to make that million. For sure. Right? Having a million in the bank after taxes, that's a, that's a milestone. But making a million, because unless you're, you know, just hoarding the money for yourself, a lot of that gets reinvested. A lot of that gets reinvested in order to, to keep increasing the, the quality and getting a certain level of guests, the production, and uh, just being able to move around and, and really do that. So yeah, getting a million is, is, is not is not the goal because you could be at a 10%, you know, profit margin where that's only $100,000. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Which, what about the first million in your bank account, Vlad? <laughs> that, that, that felt good. All right. That felt good. But a lot of that came from, from investing. Oh, okay. Yeah. A lot of it, it wasn't just stacking YouTube money. It was really like, all right, like take this money and have, have that money make more money. That, that's the goal. Like, like th that's not even the goal. That's sort of the, the line between ri rich and poor. Like the people like to say middle class. But middle class is not exactly a real thing. It, it's, a, it's a construct. Damn, does Vlad say there's no middle class? On there there, there really isn't. There really isn't. Because until you're at the point of actually investing in your money is making money and what you have is growing on a regular basis, it doesn't really matter how much money you're bringing in. If you're, if you're bringing a bunch of money and everything's going into your mortgage, in your, in your car note, in your lifestyle, and you have one month in the bank as your savings, you're, you're one bad situation away from, from being homeless. Wow. Right? You know, if you can't work for six months, and you don't have that six months put aside, everything you have, because I, I, I had a situation like when, when my company crashed, I had to sell my house. I had a half million dollar house. In, in the Oakland Hills. And, and that was the first house I ever bought. Yeah, tell me this, why I've never heard of Oakland Hills. <laughs> Oakland Hills, yeah. Um, Montclair was a neighborhood. You can look wow. it up, very nice neighborhood. It was it was in the hills overlooking the bay, like it was dope. What were you doing? Oh, you were doing that. I had the, I had the um, it was called Giga Staff. It was a staffing company. Got it, it was doing well and we were kicking ass. Yeah. And suddenly out of nowhere, the business changed and I couldn't make the type of money I was used to making. I had to sell a house. Yeah. that I did not want to sell. I thought I was middle class, but I was really poor pretending to have more than I really deserved at the time. I was, I was thinking the money's going to keep coming forever and I was spending it like it was going to come forever when I didn't really have money put aside. So when things changed, I had to sell my house. I had to shut down the business. I had to totally rethink my whole life. That's not, that's not rich. That, that, that's poor. You know, yeah. that's being poor and being hit with a bad situation that poor people go through. And I thought because I had an expensive house and a, and a Benz that I thought I was rich, but I wasn't. Yeah. I was just working poor. I was working in order to maintain those bills. So 
until you get to the point where your money is growing and this is happening over the course of many years, it doesn't matter what your salary is. If you're not investing your money because you're technically losing money every year just from uh, interest rates. Yeah. You know, from inflation. $1,000 today is not what it was five years ago. You saw what's happened recently. It doesn't buy the same amount of stuff. So you have to, once you, your money is building in and of itself and you're just working to help put more money into that pile, that's when things change and you look at money differently. Before then, you're just making enough to, to buy the cool material shit that you like, the car that you want to drive, the clothes that you want, taking trips, whatever else. That's cool. But a lot of poor people do that. You know what I'm saying? And you have to realize what it is that you are. If, if you want to change. Damn. I'm going to give you these last. Um, so for the bongs, these are peace water. Okay. It's all natural solution. So it's water for bongs. It's yeah. bong water. So it makes the hit smoother and it keeps the bong clean. Okay. And it removes the hassle of having to clean it because you could just rinse it with hot water. And oh, really? Yeah, because yeah. trying to clean a bong is Literally. like. Slim keeps leaving me. Right? Do you have dogs? I have a Rottweiler. Aww. Yeah. Yeah, she's a, she's a lunatic. My producer said me too. Yeah, she's an absolute psychopath. <laughs> it's funny if you, she knows you, like my barber who I've had yeah. since she was, you know, since we brought her home. She sees him and it's all good. You know, my car wash guy that comes over, everyone's cool. Any level of stranger, she barks and lunges at. <laughs> she can't be around other dogs. Damn. She's just asocial. But she's yeah. great with everyone around me, but yeah. How much were you going to buy XXL for? It wasn't a conversation about money. I think um, uh, he, he threw some some dollar amount. I forgot what was it. How much was it? A couple of million maybe. Oh, wow. Is that reasonable for that time? It wasn't a, re a reasonable conversation because it was like, I'm going to give it to you for this amount, sight unseen. You can't go through like the nuts and bolts of it. And I'm like. Wait. Yeah. So it wasn't like a serious conversation. Wow. Because it's like, if it was serious, I'd have to see under the hood and see what exactly is happening. Yeah. Without that, I'm just going to throw money into a, a black hole, not knowing what, what it's really about. So. For sure. Where would you be now if you sold your company for 700K back in 2010? Oh, man. Yeah, I almost sold for 700,000 right when I launched. I don't know. Someone I, knew that. Someone knew the potential. Yeah, no, but it was, it was just by luck. We, I had sold the company. They just couldn't come up with the rest of the money. So, so the deal fell apart because uh, it was. That's tough. The economy was going through its ups and downs. Yeah. I, I launched. You'd be surprised how many companies, great companies, launched during the worst times. Yeah. Because during those times, that's when you're forced to rethink a lot of shit. Uh, but where would I be? I would have probably just launched something. Something else. Something else. But <laughs> I might have signed a contract that would have prevented me. I mean, I don't know. It would have really uh, fucked up my trajectory. Yeah. It, it would have really not, it would have really taken away from what it is that I, I did because, yeah, because I took the quick money. Well, at the time, 700000 was all the money in the world. I had never, sure. I had never touched that type of money. The taxes would have been relatively light because it was like a shareholder kind of thing. We, I'd set up a whole new corporation just to deal with that deal. Yeah. So I was like, like actually, I, I was all in. Yeah. You know, the... The down payment they gave me basically just went to legal bills. So it's not like I had made any money and they couldn't come up with the money. And it was like, it just worked out that they, they, they didn't. I had another friend that wanted to invest in the company, but he wanted to give me like 10000 or 25000 or whatever. And just that amount just didn't make. Anything. Just a one-time fee? Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Ron Artest wanted to invest early on. Oh, but, I just booked yeah. him for B-Roll. A lot of things could have gone a different type of way, but yeah. I've always been like, I'm just not great at partnerships. Yeah, you know, I felt like this will only work if it's just my thing. That's the whole thing, right? Yeah. Like build your own shit so you don't yeah. have to deal with anyone else. Yeah, that was the, the point about the Taraji thing was if we go full circle into that, my whole thing was at the point in her life, if she feels she's not getting properly compensated, she should be doing her own thing by either funding it herself or partnering with people that she respects, that have the skills that she doesn't have, whether it's production, direction, writing, lighting, camera work, whatever else. Right. And, Interesting. and, and put together her own shit. Yeah, because a lot of people th have That's what I felt I had to do early on. I knew I was going to get properly compensated. Yeah. That Ghost Ride the Whip documentary didn't make me any money. Damn, after. I was going to ask because your girl grew up in the hyphy movement. Like, right. that's literally, I feel like how I fell in love with, I mean, Eminem first, but the hyphy movement, like, 
You know, like, were you ghostwriting the whip line? Like, yeah. let me find out. Really? All that. all that. Yeah, I was right in the middle of all that. I were was, you at sideshows? Uh, no, nah, I didn't do sideshows. Okay. I wasn't really in the middle of it like that. I was more like documenting it. But that was after. That counts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was documenting it as it was still sort of hot. Yeah. And, uh, but Mac Trey had already died. I'd never met Mac oh, Trey. Oh, man. Yeah, I'd, I'd never met Rest Mac Trey. Peace. So, yeah, I, I was right there. Cause I did that and I was Were you did, doing the thizzle dance? Were you getting high feet? Cause I yeah, know you were a break dancer. So yeah, I was a little something, a little <laughs> something, not, not all the way, a little something. Uh, but yeah, I, cause I also did the American gangster on Mac Dre. Oh, wow. So, so that was like sort of my kind of love letters to the Bay. Like yeah. Those two projects were like, yo, like this is where I'm from. And here's like a couple That's of awesome. dope pieces That's to, awesome. to my, you know, the home that I grew up in. Yeah. Like y'all, y'all could have this for future generations. I know Eminem is one of the top artists you want to interview. Yeah. What would you ask him? I think I would really get into Eminem's story of him growing up. I think that's something that's never really been discussed. I mean, everyone knows the things he went through to get to where he was and the, the rap battles and how Eminem, and Dr. Dre found him. Blah, blah, blah. Everyone knows that part. And everyone's seen how things have sort of worked out in the public with him and various people. But I, I think that it'd be dope to sort of see what formed Eminem into what he is because when I first heard about him, it was on a, it was on this this website called Sandbox Automatic. It was like a text-based website that, that used to sell independent vinyl, independent hip hop vinyl. And I remember there was like, they would always have like the, the top five or something. And then this guy's project, the Eminem project was like, in the top five, the Marshall Mathers EP. This mm. is this is what came out before Dre yeah. uh, signed him, and they put they, they put out an extended like an expanded version of that. But I remember I had that as an independent CD at the time. Nice. And when you heard it, you're like, he's just so much better than everyone else right, right now. Right. There's such a, a gap in skill level that it was so obvious. Wow. What was happening? It'd be interesting to see what what got to there because. At that point, it's like everyone wanted to work with him. It was yeah. if it wasn't Dre signing him, he would have gotten signed somewhere else. Right. It, it, was, it was just obvious what was happening. So yeah. See, that's like an interview I would watch. <clears throat> you know, like yeah. that would be epic. Yeah, I don't know if it'll ever happen. Right. I've just, never actually spoken to him, so. Yeah, and I don't think he's doing interviews. Yeah. But we're gonna end on the Temple Ten Spitfire round. All right, favorite snack. Favorite snack. Don't think too hard. Could it be liquid? Is that considered a snack? No. No, it has to be solid. Well, what would your liquid be? Fresh apple juice. No, doesn't count. Doesn't count. <laughs> Favorite snack? Those, I think the Japanese kiwi gummies. Oh, those sound fire. Called. Favorite moment with Boosie? Uh, being at his house. Having a tour of his house. That was really dope. For sure. Biggest fear? Biggest fear. Uh, prison. Damn. <laughs> Have you been in prison? I've got locked up, like jail. Like a couple of days. Okay. Little little things, you know, like suspended license. Oh, damn. That, that type of dumb, like, dumb you're shit. there because of your own fault. Yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing ever violent or drug related or anything. Biggest yeah. pet peeve? Oh, uh, people waste my time. That's real. Yeah. That's the most important thing that we have is time. Top five all time. Uh, rappers or? Yeah. Or do uh, you have this on deck? No, nah, in no particular order. Let's see. Tupac, Ice Cube. Be real. Hey. Then it gets hard. <laughs> Let's see. That's three, right? That's three. Two more. Two more. Uh, easy E. Okay. And uh, uh, Kendrick. Oh, wow. Really? Yes. I did yeah. not know you listen to Kendrick yeah, like that. Yeah, so, so Kendrick in the mix. I, I, I think oh. what... Oh. Uh, <laughs> so cute. I think what Kendrick's pulled off is, is remarkable. Nobody could deny it. Right. It, it, it is what it is. He's established himself as one of the greats of this era. So you can't just exclude him from the conversation. For sure. Yeah. I feel like he's someone that just is living life and doesn't yeah. have to do shit. Kendrick's one of my neighbors as well. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I heard he doesn't really be on his phone. <laughs> nah. Yeah. Must be nice. Yeah. I wish I could be like that. Right. Me too. That's the goal Goals. to get so lit. You don't Goals. have to be on your phone. Favorite Kendrick song? Favorite Kendrick song? All right. We gonna be all right. Oh, okay. That's yeah. a good one. I, I was there at the, the video shoot. They were doing part of it in San Francisco, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Yes, that was that was a moment. That's beautiful. Candace, are you getting this? Because we need this. I'm a dog person though. You know I what I'm know. saying? She knows. Oh, he, he. He, my bad. He knows. No, you're good. You're good. He looks a little, a little feminine. So <laughs> I'm just saying. Wait, are you saying my dog looks like a girl, Vlad? I mean, a little bit. A little bit. I mean, it can be confused for a girl. You don't <laughs> think? You don't think this dog can be confused for, for a girl? Get the zoom. <laughs> <laughs> oh man he's looking at me like a lot of people do just call him a girl that's rough okay dumbest bag you ever dropped the dumbest bag uh I've, I've talked about this before when i uh bought the kilo cocaine what back in the 90s a kilo a kilo for seventeen thousand. We got ripped off by my so-called friend yep that was pretty dumb wait uh, that was the dumbest bag i ever dropped yep the fact that i even did it it was so dumb and, and I remember being mad at the at the guy for ripping me off for for years and years, until I interviewed Freeway Ricky and I actually told him on camera what I had done. Yeah, because I'm like, fuck it, it's past statute of limitations. Who cares? I'm, right. You know, let's just use it as content. Let's make, make some of this money back. Right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, make some of the seventeen. That's hilarious. Back. I've, I've be, I and, definitely. And, and he that. said it, it, it was such a light bulb when he said it. He said, "Well, had he not ripped you off." You could have gone to prison. <laughs> and I said, oh shit, I didn't think of it. I didn't think about that. I could have gone to prison. A kilo of cocaine would have been absolute True. prison time. Multiple years probably. And God knows how my life would have turned out had I gone into the prison system. Who knows? So had that since that didn't happen, he just ripped me off. And I remember I ran into him years later and he told me he'd pay me back and he never did. But whatever. I don't want any of that money back at this point. Uh, it just blows my mind because you talk about the prison system and the fact that Freeway was on Shirley Temple. I asked him about how he lived off peanut butter and oatmeal. Yeah, well, you know, I just said, you know, I mean, just be eating oatmeal and, and peanut butter. The whole time? I, I had lied. For how long was he in there? 16 years? He, he was there for a while. Well, he had life. Insane. So Yeah, no, but it, it, put it, all, it put it all in perspective for me. It was like, it was just a lesson of like, all right, this drug shit ain't for me. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm not a drug dealer. Okay, like I, I'm sure of this at this point. Yeah. It's not in the back of my mind thinking, what if I, I would never be the next Pablo Escobar? No, I'm cool. Yeah. Like uh, I'm gonna live a nice square, regular life. I'm cool with that. <laughs> Childhood crush. Ooh, that's a good one. I like Bo Derek. Those of y'all, y'all probably don't know who that y'all is. Y'all know who that is? Bo Derek. Bo Derek. She had braids. Braids. Bo Derek with the braids. braids. We're gonna put a braids. picture up of Bo Derek with the Bo braids. Bo Derek with the braids. Um, yeah. What's your ideal date night? Oh man, uh, I don't know. I've been kind of out of the dating pool for a minute, so it's been a minute. But okay, well, but you I know, know I, did, I did, I did, I did, I did date, world. I did date quite a bit. I, I did, I did date quite a bit. So, so you deserve an answer. Let me think. Yeah. Um, I know you said you treated j- dating like a job. Yeah. Well, because when you're looking for someone, you can't just expect that person to magically for sure. appear. You can't pray your way into a, a soulmate. Like you, you have to go out there and actually look. I, I just had so many uh, restaurant dates and bar <laughs> dates that I, I think just something out of the ordinary. Okay. Do you, you have know? a favorite restaurant in LA? In LA, my favorite restaurant in LA was Rock Sugar. They closed down during the pandemic. Love, love, love that restaurant. And yeah. uh, they went out of business. Um, there's a lot in LA. You know, Bloodstone's Barbecue has my, my favorite ribs. Oh, okay. I just did a feature on them. And those ribs are ridiculous. Like the spare ribs. Damn. Are, are insane. I'm vegan, so I can't relate. You're but. vegan. Okay. <laughs> we have a crossroads in Calabasas. It's oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It doesn't really blow me away. Yeah. It's cool. Shout out to Travis Barker, though. Yeah, Travis Barker's always over there. Yeah. Let me think. This is actually a good um, <laughs> a good question. I should really know the answer to this. The, the, the Chateau Mormont, the, the restaurant there oh, is really okay. dope. Um, Spago's is really dope. Nice. I like Spago's do a lot. Do you love LA? I do. I do love LA. Yeah, yeah. L.A., I think, like, there's lots of places to live, but I think at some point everyone aspires to have a spot in L.A. For sure. You know, I think once you reach a certain level, it may not be the place where you call home, but you're usually here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I also have a spot in New York. I, I feel oh, like, wow. like that's, that's important for me for to sure. kind of maintain. Favorite sex position? <laughs> uh... I don't know what this is called. Oh. The girl's like on her stomach. <laughs> From the back? Yeah. Okay. Like froggy style or something Wait, like that. doggy style? Froggy, froggy style. Oh, froggy style? That's a thing. Damn, I don't know my sex position. Yeah. 
I, I don't know the, the specific name of it. <laughs> I don't know if it's been officially Christian Froggy style. I'm dead. All right. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, Vlad. Vlad? Yeah. What do you think of when you think of yourself? Um... I guess I was just thinking about my childhood and just sort of the the, the surprise that it kind of worked out. I, I just always remember the the uncertainty and, and not knowing. For and, sure. And, and the anxiety and everything else like that. I, I always think about how how it'd be how dope it would be to go back and visit the young version of myself and tell them. That's interesting. That's going to be okay. Yeah. It's all, it's all going to work out. Like all this stuff you're Freaking hoping out. will happen. It'll all happen. Like right. All the stuff you're asking for will happen. Not exactly the way you think it's going to happen, but it's all going to fit into place. Are you spiritual? And, um, eh, not not so much. I'm not religious. I don't I don't believe in God. Like you know, um, so I'm atheist. I guess would be a wow. way to describe it. I would like to think that that something more happens after we pass away, but I'm not counting on it. Yeah, you know, just like. You know, when, when your dog ultimately passes away. Oh, no, or, never or, that. Or, or, or these plants ultimately pass away. Right. Is there a next version of that? Or is it just, it's done. And yeah. it's on to the next thing. For sure. So, so yeah, it's hard for me to really be spiritual or religious for myself seeing any sort of proof. I hear you. As to that. And, you know, that's just my thing. And I respect people that, that feel otherwise. Definitely. Well, thank you for coming on. Is there anything else you want to say or promote? Nah, I mean, uh, check out Vlad TV on YouTube. Check uh, out Shirley's Temple, Vlad TV and, and, viewers. And Shirley Temple. Thank you. We need uh, help. You know, and thank, thank you for having me because uh, I know how these things go when there's a falling out, especially when it's a public falling out. For sure. Uh, it doesn't always get worked out. For sure. And, and I appreciate you letting me come on here and and, you know, accepting my apology. Uh, I, I've always wished you the best and uh, I'm happy with you. You're still in the industry in a place that's hard, hard to maintain. It's especially, really hard. Especially in the place that you're at right now. Yeah. It's a, it's a very much of a, you know, in between sure. kind, of, kind of time. And, uh, you know, just, just stick with it and keep doing your thing. And I've, I've always been proud of, of the hustle. I've always respected that. And even though we had our, our tiff, stuff like that, um, you know, I've never had any sort of anything else to say after that. You know what I'm saying? For sure. And I've always, I've always had respect. Because I, you know, I was hoping at some point we could work it out. And, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. I genuinely was sad. You know? Because yeah. I was like, yeah, and that, and I we felt, were homies. And I felt bad about that. You know? Yeah. Because, because remember, you, the last time we saw each other was with Gangster Boo. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Rest. And then, me. and then she passed away yeah. maybe about a month later. Right. And that was, that was the moment. It was like, yo, me, Shirley, Fredro. Right. We were all on that couch. Um, Razkaz. Right. Uh, my man, Idi Amin. Yeah. Uh, Sticky Fingers. Like, it was like this little hip hop moment. For sure. None of us knew that one of us was not going to last another month. Right. And then Fentanyl killed one of our, our hip hop heroes. Right. And you just realized, like, like life is too short. You yeah. know, you got to... I'm glad the time I got to spend with her. Me too. That she, is. She, she was a cool person. Down yeah. to earth. Yeah, she was. I a remember cool that night she was telling me, like, and I, I don't even think I do it that much, but she was like, hey, yo, Shirley, you know, we can kick it without cameras, right? Like, let's go eat. Like, we don't need to be doing, you yeah. know? And it's that cool. just, it, it meant a lot to me, yeah. you know? Cause I was like, damn, you just wanna kick it? Like, damn, you know? That's, yeah. She's just a real one. She really was. She, yeah. she, she was an icon. She was an icon from Memphis. And uh, everyone should take this as a, uh, as a wake-up call because the, these street drugs. I, I, she was actually, she was in Memphis and she missed her flight or the flight was canceled back to L.A. Because she doesn't live in Memphis. She lives in L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was on her way back to L.A. and something happened where she couldn't make it. So she was like, all right, one more night of party. And I believe her and her brother overdosed, but her brother ended up getting revived. Yeah. But they had a bad batch. But that's terrible. You're doing, you're doing hard drugs. This is now what comes with it. Right. This is the at some point it could it could kill you. You know, and we've lost Michael K. Williams. Right. Little Peep. Yeah. Uh, 
a lot a lot of people juice world juice world yeah Mac Miller, damn. Mac Miller. That's fucked up. A lot. A lot Man, of people. I'm not going to lie. I've, a lot of people got lost. I feel like my end goal is like at the end of the day, like I just have such a soft spot for like addicts and addiction. Like I just, you know, I feel like as much as all this is great, like I, I just in the long term, like I would love to somehow give back to that because yeah. I feel like it's fucked up just how many people just die to the disease, you know? Yeah. Drug addiction is some shit. And uh, this is what you see out here in L.A. Right, like, like these these huge homeless encampments. Like this yeah. is this is drug addiction. You could say it's this, yeah, that, or the do. third, but yeah. ultimately, I think the driving underlying force of all of the foundation of it, I think, is drug addiction. Crazy. That's, That's what sad. I think. That makes me sad. On a lighter note, thank you for coming on Shirley Simple. Thank you for hanging out with Slim. Absolutely. What's up, y'all? It's DJ Vlad of Vlad TV. Thank you for tuning in to Shirley's Temple. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>